We understand why China is angry about this visit. But why are US lawmakers angry? Not all of them, but a sizable section. Around 75 million lawmakers have written a letter to Joe Biden. And what do they want? They want their president to raise so-called areas of concern with Prime Minister Modi. And what are these concerns? Well, the usual stuff, alleged human rights abuses, attacks on religious minorities, and democratic backsliding. I'll simplify that for you. These lawmakers want Joe Biden to lecture Modi on democracy. As simple as that. But who are these 75 people? All of them are Democrats, just like Biden. There are 18 senators and 57 members of the House. You may know some of them, like Bernie Sanders. He's technically independent, but he sits with the Democrats. Elizabeth Warren is another name on this list. So is Pramila Jaipal. These members are part of the so-called progressive wing of the Democratic Party. I guess progressive means meddling in other countries. The letter uses a very complex strategy. It doesn't oppose Prime Minister Modi's visit, neither does it say anything against India-US relations. In fact, it strongly advocates both. Let me quote from what it says. We join you in welcoming Prime Minister Modi to the United States. We want a close and warm relationship. That is why we respectfully request that you also raise directly with Prime Minister Modi areas of concern. How absurd is that? Imagine you've invited someone to your home, you welcome them, saying that it's a pleasure to host. But after that, you unleash a rant. You trash your visitor's way of life, you question their parenting style, you also tell them how to manage their families. How would you feel if you were on the receiving end of this? Offended, I'm sure. Which is why most rational countries don't do this. Not the Americans, though. They love lecturing others on human rights and democracy. What about their own record? These 75 law lawmakers won't talk Three. about their own record. India is one of their favorite targets. Let me tell you a bit more about them. Both Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren ran for president in 2019. Biden beat them to get the nomination. Back then, both leaders had criticized India. This was around the time when India revoked Kashmir's special status. Sanders and Warren felt that they had to say something about it. I guess gun violence and racism were not pressing enough. Pramila Jaipal is no different. She pushed a resolution on Kashmir in 2019. I say resolution, but it was more of a diktat. Lift the internet shutdown. Don't use violence on protesters. Remember, this is a US lawmaker telling India how to administer its own province. Needless to say, the resolution was defeated. But imagine the opposite happening. What if an Indian MP proposed a resolution telling Biden how to solve the migrant crisis in Texas or the abortion bans? It's absurd, which is why it won't happen. A few other lawmakers have gone beyond these 75, like these two, Rashida Talib and Ilan Omar. They did not even sign this letter to Biden. Why? Because they don't think Modi should be here in the first place. Both Talib and Omar will boycott the Prime Minister's speech to the US Congress. What explains this attitude? Well, one reason could be domestic politics. Both Talib and Omar represent areas with a sizable Muslim population. And that vote bank is key to their electoral success. So what do they do? Well, they talk about alleged Islamophobia elsewhere. And India is on their radar, but it's not the only one. Israel is another country that these lawmakers regularly target. Both Omar and Talib have voted to stop selling weapons to Israel. My point is, this position helps them. It helps their politics. It helps to rally their voter base. And that's one of the reasons why they do what they do. The second is America's historical problem with lectures. They never seem to stop. These lawmakers feel it's their job to export democracy. But what authority do they have? An average congressional district has around 7 lakh people. That's the total population, not just the voters. In India's Lok Sabha, the biggest margin of victory is 7 lakhs. There is no comparison, really. And even if there was, lawmakers need to set their own house in order instead of lecturing other countries because we saw how robust American democracy was during the Capitol riots. Make no mistake, the folks in Beijing are keenly watching this visit. I bet they won't like what they see. A massive reception, a state banquet, all of it signals growing cooperation between India and the US. And that's bad news for China. 
Back in New Delhi, there is consensus on one thing. China is the new big challenge, not Pakistan. China is a challenge. Here in Washington, there is a similar consensus. China and not Russia is the chief rival now. So there is unity on that front. There may be difference on the approach, but the sentiment is the same. China means bad news. How is Beijing reacting to this consensus? Well, there are five stages of grief, they say, and China is on the first stage, denial. Their former foreign minister, Wang Yi, wrote an opinion piece this week. The headline sums up the story. This is what it says. India's economic ties with the US cannot replace its trade with China. One question though. Is he telling this to the world or trying to convince himself? Now, Wang Yi is still a prominent figure in Beijing. When US Secretary of State Antony Blinken visited China, he had three meetings and one of those meetings was with Wang Yi. So what he says carries weight. It's not the musings of a former diplomat. Let me quote some important bits from what he has written. As feared by many Indian elites, Washington's vigorous efforts to strengthen economic and trade cooperation with India is primarily to slow down China's economic development. Let me simplify that. Wang Yi says America has an ulterior motive, that they're using India only to weaken China. He says Washington pays lip service but seldom delivers. Broadly speaking, this op-ed has three arguments. One, America is not genuine, it is only using India. Two, India cannot replace China in the global supply chain. And three, nothing can stop the rise of China-US trade or India-China trade. Now let's analyze these arguments. Is America really playing India? Well, if they are, the acting is top class, we have to say. It's up to Joe Biden to disprove Wang Yi's statement. India has made the leap of faith. The US needs to reciprocate with concrete moves. As for supply chain and trade, it's too early for that, really. Yes, bilateral trade is growing, but these things cannot change overnight, or for that matter, in one or two years. Realigning trade and supply is a long game. It takes years. The fact that India and the US are doing that, working towards that, has spooked Beijing. Wang Yi also has some advice for New Delhi. He says, promote trade and cooperation with China. Well, why not? It's not like China tried to seize Indian territory or kill Indian soldiers. Except they did exactly that. India's position on China has been clear. In fact, the Prime Minister reiterated it during an interview. This is what he said. For normal ties with China, peace and tranquility in the border is essential. China doesn't seem to understand that. Their proposal is this. Forget the border. Let's increase trade. I'm afraid that won't fly. America's equation with China is also complicated, minus the border. Let's look at the events of this week. Joe Biden sent his top diplomat, Antony Blinken, to Beijing. The expectations were rock bottom. And so were the results. It was actually classic Cold War playbook. Both sides agreed to stabilize relations, but they did nothing to actually implement that. In fact, Biden may be doing the opposite. He attended a campaign event on Tuesday, Joe Biden. And he spoke about the spy balloon saga between the US and China. And while doing that, he called Xi Jinping a dictator. He said Xi was embarrassed because he didn't know where the balloon was. Needless to say, China is not happy. Their foreign ministry has called it absurd and irresponsible. The relevant remarks by the US side are extremely absurd, irresponsible and seriously violate basic facts, diplomatic protocol and China's political dignity. They are an open political provocation. China is strongly dissatisfied with and firmly opposed to this. Question to China though. What do you call an unelected leader who has appointed himself for life? If not a dictator, then what? Biden and Modi will have to figure that out. China may not be the only issue on the agenda, but it's an important and urgent one. Something that even voters in both countries realize, which is why Biden said that he did what he did rather at the campaign event. He called she a dictator. New Delhi and Washington will have to figure out a roadmap. What will the US-India plan against China look like? Is it purely economic? Is it purely strategic? Is it a mix of the two? Let's see if tomorrow's bilateral gives us some answers to these questions. So the defense deal is making all the buzz, but there's another sector where the US and India are cooperating and that's semiconductors or chips. They're often called the oil of the 21st century, the key to global domination. So it's no surprise that chips are a contested asset. The US and China are both trying to dominate this market. 
They're locked in what's called a chip war. As of today, Washington is leading the race, but China is catching up fast. Where does that leave India? Well, at a vantage point, we say. As a credible alternative to China and a reliable partner for the world, the US wants to move away, away from China. It wants to make sure that Beijing doesn't get critical technology. It wants to build semiconductors with like-minded countries, aka India. This is called friendshoring. Offshoring with friendly countries, that's friendshoring for you. And this is a big opportunity for India. Because irrespective of what the US wants, India has been pushing itself as an alternative to China. India does not have native semiconductor firms, so it's trying to woo foreign giants. And part of this push is a $10 billion incentive plan. It is aimed at boosting semiconductor manufacturing. And this works well for the US as well. America can support India as it tries to weaken China's chip industry. Again, this looks like a natural fit, and they've been at it for a while. In September last year, the Quad took up this issue. They moved to secure semiconductor supply chains. The Quad, as you know, is a member of four is a group rather of four countries, four members: India, America, Japan, and Australia. And in March this year, an MOU was signed. A memorandum of understanding was signed. It was signed between India and the US. This was to establish a semiconductor supply chain. Reports say India has now cleared a $2.7 billion micron chip testing plant. Micron is a major chip company in America. They will set up a plant in India. And this came just ahead of Prime Minister Modi's state visit. The plan is to set up a semiconductor testing and packaging unit. It will be built in the state of Gujarat. India has promised production-linked incentives. We're talking about incentives worth $1.34 billion. Remember, this is the same Micron, the same company, that China has recently banned. Washington is asking American firms to invest in India and to move away from China. And the Micron plant is a good start. But this unit will only test and pack semiconductor chips. It won't make in India. New Delhi will have to aim for that, for making in India. For India to dominate the chip market, it will have to manufacture chips. Currently, the chip global supply chain is complicated. Chips are designed in the United States, they're manufactured in Taiwan and South Korea, and then they're assembled in China. If India wants to become a key player, it will have to move fast. It will have to ramp up manufacturing. The plans are already in place. India will get its first semiconductor plant in Gujarat. It is being built by Taiwan-based Foxconn and India's Vedanta. Similarly, ISMC Digital is planning to build a $3 billion fabrication plant. This will be located in the state of Karnataka. So India has the potential to become a key manufacturer if things move in the same direction and at the same pace. India could achieve that in three to four years. And then it should start work on the next step. Dream bigger. Think about chip design. As of today, it sounds like a long shot. But remember, India has exceptional talent pool. 20% of the world's semiconductor design engineers are from India. The government has launched a chip design center. The idea is to encourage a chip design ecosystem in India with or without American support. So this is what we have, both celebrations and criticism, as you would expect with any major visit. And behind the scenes, some serious work is also being done. We've been telling you about the defense deals. They are on top of the agenda. The Americans are going all out. The stage was set over the last few weeks. Biden sent his biggest cabinet members to India. The defense minister and the national security advisor in quick succession. Two weeks ago, Lloyd Austin landed in New Delhi. He's the US defense secretary. It's their version of a defense minister. He met with the Indian defense minister, Rajnath Singh. And the two leaders agreed on a roadmap for defense cooperation. The US-India partnership is a cornerstone of a free and open Indo-Pacific. And our deepening bonds show how te technological innovation and growing military cooperation between two great powers can be a force for global good. And so on this visit, I am pleased that we have taken new steps to strengthen our defense partnership. We established an ambitious new roadmap for defense industrial cooperation. Some two decades back, this would have sounded impossible. But today, it's all happening. It shows how far the India-US relationship has come. On this visit, some major defense deals are expected. We'll be able to confirm the specifics only when the official announcement has been made. But we can tell you that there will be two broad parts to it. Jet engines and drones. I'll tell you about the jet engines first. A deal is in the works. It involves two companies. 
America's General Electric and India's Hindustan Aeronauticals Limited or HAL. Now this is extremely significant because they're talking about joint production. GE will transfer its technology to HAL. HAL will use this technology to produce engines in India. These engines will then be used for our indigenous Tejas jets. How does it help India? Well, India wants to expand its domestic defense production and this deal is going to help. It's a much needed boost for the industry. Also a major shift in America's approach towards India. You see, such military technology is guarded by countries. It's a st strategic asset. The Americans are very choosy about whom they share it with. And in the past, they've denied India access to critical tech, but now they're offering it, even pushing for it. And this shows how much they're ready to invest in the partnership. The other part of the defense deal is drones. India is looking to buy armed drones, around 30 MQ-9B Predator drones. They're manufactured by a company called General Atomics Aeronautical Systems Inc. We spoke to the CEO of that company, Dr. Vivek Lal, on what they plan to do, which drones India wants to buy, and how soon they can be delivered. We'll bring you a part of that conversation in a bit. But first, let me tell you more about the deal. It is said to be worth $3 billion. The Defense Acquisition Council has approved it. So there's a good chance that this deal will be announced during this visit. India could get defense tech and drones, but that's not all. The US is also keen on the fighter jet program for the Navy and the Air Force. It's pushing Boeing Super, Boeing Super Hornets and the F-21s. Another key aspect is BECA. BECA, it stands for Basic Exchange and Cooperation Agreement. Both nations are expected to sign on certain clauses this time. And this pact, BECA, was first signed in the year 2020. It helps India get sensitive data from U.S. military satellites, something that could help in the border standoff with China. So India is clearly getting a lot. But what's in it for the Americans? Well, two things. One is weaning India off dependence on Russian weapons. And two, countering China. India, remember, is the world's biggest importer of weapons. It depends on Russia for most of its military supplies. But the Ukraine war changed that. Moscow is preoccupied right now. New Delhi is still waiting for the delivery of two S-400 missile systems. So India wants to look at other options. And that's where the United States comes in. It seems like a perfect combination. In the past, though, it was far from perfect. For decades, India and the US had a frosty relationship, especially during the Cold War, even after that. Remember, during the Kargil War, India wanted GPS, the US said no. Same for nuclear submarines. India wanted them, Washington denied. In fact, until the year 2008, India-US defense trade was negligible. Fast forward to 2020, it was over $20 billion. So clearly the distrust is gone. Washington knows that it needs New Delhi and defense ties have become crucial to this relationship. In fact, in an interview to the Wall Street Journal, Prime Minister Modi called the India-US defense cooperation, quote unquote, an important pillar of partnership. Well, they're on the right trajectory. What they need is sustained engagement and the right mix of incentives. It could take this partnership to new heights. And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. We're starting with Argentina. Violent protests have erupted there. This is after a constitutional reform restricted the right to protest. Demonstrations are on in Colombia too. Thousands are marching against economic and social reforms pushed by the country's leftist government. In the US, new footage shows the devastating aftermath of a tornado in central Mississippi. And finally, what happened today in history? In the year 1945, American forces captured Okinawa during the Second World War. With this began the Allied invasion of Japan. We're leaving you with these images. Thank you very much for watching, for your patience. We're sorry for all the noise. Like I said, it's a rainy morning in Washington, D.C., but we love bringing the stories to you from wherever we are. We'll see you tomorrow. The bloodiest battle of the Pacific War has ended in victory for the Americans on Okinawa. 330 miles from the home islands of Japan, the stars and stripes are hoisted on this most vital strategic... 
una situación completamente descontrolada. Escuchamos que hay respuesta en el primero con dos. Casi la queremos que no Y ahora sí, la policía que ha de goma y también han lanzado gran cantidad de manifestantes. Que... Cuarto auto y la policía intenta exactamente. Primero con, primero con eh, gas. Miras a la policía, ahí corren el portón, abren el portón directamente. Rompelo, no saques nada, rompelo. Es impresionante. No para de no, no, no. avanzar. Thank mm -hmm. you.